Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be presenting this work. Um, this is a new area or new extension of my research. Um, and so I'm very excited to be bringing it to um, everyone today. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is the intersectionality of race and skin color um, in relationship to black women's perinatal health outcomes, um, including healthcare utilization. So first, I want to just kind of start off with who am I, you know, because um, who I am very much transcends this work, um, my research. And so these are just pictures of um, um, me um, and my grandmother and my sisters, as well as my parents. Um, my father is a little boy with a little dog, as well as my great grandparents and great great grandparents. And so, um, and um, uh, my great great grandmother, who lived to be over 100 years old. So, um, they very much, I think, influence who I am today, um, as well as the questions that I ask with respect to my research. Um, and I guess maybe I should also say that in terms of my background, um, my bachelor's is in engineering, um, and then my master's and my PhD are in public health, in maternal and child health and epidemiology. And it's really, one could ask the question of how does engineering and maternal and child health and epidemiology come together? But where it, I have come to, um, to say and believe is that my training in engineering, which is about systems, helps me to view the questions that I ask or the health conditions that I'm, I'm looking at from a systems perspective, and hence why my work is now integrating an intersectional approach. OK, so um, many of you all may be familiar with um, that there's a disproportionate burden um, in birth outcomes for African-American women compared to non-Hispanic white women. Um, and these are just a couple of the stories that have been in the press, um, just talking about the black-white um, disparity in terms of infant mortality, as well as most recently maternal mortality in which um, Serena Williams, when she, you know, the tennis star gave birth to her, um, her baby, um, you know, she had a severe complication during delivery. And, um, you know, and, and I think her story speaks to the story that a lot of black women may be going through with respect to um, their maternal care. Um, so these are just the, um, sort of the distribution of um, infant mortality, maternal mortality, as well as preterm delivery, um, low birth weight, and um, women with late or no prenatal care. Um, and as you can see, non-Hispanic white women have the lowest rates. Um, and then the middle, the light gray, is the US overall rate. And, um, and then you see that the non-Hispanic um, non black women have the highest rates in all um, five of these perinatal health outcomes. Um, and actually, the maternal mortality rate for African-American women approaches um, the rate in um, developing countries. So. so here's another look at, and I just um, picked infant mortality um, because all of the data shows these same trends, because that's what we're interested in, is the trend here. Um, so this is the, um, shows the trend of um, infant mortality between 1960 to 2015 um, for blacks and whites. So non-Hispanic whites are the orange trend line um, and have the lowest rate of infant mortality over this time span. Um, uh, the red line is um, the U.S. overall rate. The gray line represents um, the black infant mortality rate. And then the yellow line represents the relative difference between, between blacks and whites. Um, and what you see is that between 1960 and um, today, yes, the infant mortality rate is decreasing for both blacks and whites. However, we see that the rate in which it decreases is not equivalent, right? So it's not equitable between both of these groups. Um, and 
And actually, if we look at the period between 1960 and 1970, um, or especially between 1965 and 1970, we see that that's where the smallest difference in the black-white gap is, right? And, and guess what that time span also represents? 1964 was the passage of the Civil Rights Act, right? So during these th the four or five years after the 1964 Civil Rights Act is when you actually see infant mortality rates for blacks decrease at a faster rate than for whites. Um, but then in later years, you see that gain, right, that we've had in closing the gap um, has actually widened. So, and, and this is important because we spent a lot of time and money, and the United States puts as a national goal addressing um, this racial health disparity. Um, and a majority of studies um, do examine the black-white gap, but we're not really any closer to narrowing the gap. Um, and so, um, it calls us to really think about what is race when we're speaking about these racial dis um, health disparities. And, um, you know, one thing that um, in the last 20 years, research has been increasing to consider, um, considering this race as a social construct, right? Um, and um, has sort of come to grips better with the fact that in the US, blacks experience bigotry, discrimination, stereotyping, um, and it's really pul pulmigated um, by two separate but interlocking um, systems of oppression. And the first one is racial stratification based off of um, race. And the other one um, is colorism or skin tone stratification. And we're less familiar with skin tone stratification though. So um, I briefly touched on this a little bit, but race is really a social construct, and I think most of biomedical research has come to grips with this, although there are a few stragglers out there. <laughs> but um, it's a man-made con um, construct with significant social meaning. Um, and research has, um, health equity research has been moving away from just examining these black-white differences, like what I showed you in the earlier graphs, to trying to understand what is behind, what is race a proxy for, right? Um, and why or how does it lead to these um, disparities in outcomes? And one of those things is racism. Um, so racism is a system for continued maintenance of social dominance. Um, structure, it structures opportunities and assigns values for um, value for interpersonal exchange based on inter individuals perceived or assigned race. Um, so race is actually a proxy for limited access to resources, systemic oppression, intergenerational social exclusion, um, and even general life hassles in the day-to-day -day lives of marginalized communities. Now, race also does represent heritage and culture and identity and that, that sort of thing as well. And many of those may be protective, right, in the relationship. But um, race in this country was a construct that was really created to, um, um, for the system of oppression. All right, so let's talk about um, uh, skin tone, so shades of color. So unlike race, which has no biologic significance, skin tone does actually have some biological significance. Um, you know, your skin's an organ and its pigmentation um, uh, through human evolution it was um, created to help protect us. So it protects our DNA from ultraviolet light. Um, it helps us, um, it protects um, our stores of folate or folic acid. Um, so um, one hour of exposure to high intensity ultraviolet light, violet, um, light um, will decrease your folate um, stores by half. So um, and then also 
pigmentation um, allows us to um, help synthesize sufficient levels of vitamin D, right? So those who have a lighter skin tone um, may uh, um, uh, synthesize um, higher levels of, D, of vitamin D than those with darker pigmentation. But a lot of this, the um, range in skin tones um, is equated, um, is correlated with where um, indigenous groups um, are geographically, I should say. So um, those groups who, populations that live in, um, in an area that is closer to the equator, has higher levels of ultraviolet light, um, you see the darker pigmentation. Whereas when you get further away and closer to more of the poles, where ultraviolet light is um, greater, you, uh, sorry, less, you have lighter skin pigmentations and that's to allow for the process of vitamin D synthesis as well as um, protection of your folate. Okay. However, our skin also has um, a huge social significance as well and that's what I'm gonna focus on today. Um, so the color continuum of skin tone is embedded with notions of attractiveness and intellect um, that stem from slavery and colonization. Um, and um, one of the terms that we call um, uh, color-based or skin tone um, uh, discrimination is colorism. And it's a phenotype-based continuum that assigns privilege um, and disadvantaged based on one's shade of color. And privilege is generally allocated to individuals with lighter complexions um, and more European-like features, while individuals with darker complexions um, and more Afrocentric features um, are disadvantaged. And um, this can also be extended to phenotypic traits, um, so narrower nose, um, straight hair, eye color, um, and so research poses, or maybe I should also say that um, colorism can occur between groups, but there's also within group colorism, and the within group colorism is actually a form of institution of, of internalized racism. Okay. Um, so research posits um, skin tone may have more significance in the lives of women of color than men of color um, in certain areas, especially um, in societies that are rooted in a history of slavery um, or colonialism where female beauty is equated with being light-skinned and having these Eurocentric features. Um, so some areas where women of color um, may be more influenced um, by skin tone include self-perceptions um, because of the notions around attractiveness um, and even intellect, um, marital patterns. So we're not talking about whether you get married or not, but how early, the timing in which you get married, as well as who you marry. Um, and also levels of education attainment and then overall standards of living. So how does race and skin tone come together um, and affect health? So skin tone may interact with race to increase vulner um, vulnerability and exposure to racism-related stressors um, or other race-related stressors. Um, for people of color, including African Americans. Um, and, you know, the extant biomedical research has shown skin tone gradients to exist in hypertension, blood pressure, um, uh, general overall health measures, um, depressive symptoms, as well as allostatic load. And in general, the relationship is that um, lighter skin tone is associated with a better outcome or lower allostatic load. 
So, all right, um, just continuing talking about um, uh, the intersection of race and skin tone with respect to black women's health, um, it's really, that area is in its infancy. I mean, even the full body of literature on skin tone and health is in its infancy, but even more so in terms of um, women's health, which I find really interesting considering um, the more social science literature, the a larger body of social science literature that says that um, skin tone may be more salient for women of color um, than men of color. Um, but of the studies that are um, that have either looked at gender differences or they've focused completely on a female population, um, the data suggests that skin tone is a predictor of body mass index, um, that there's gender defects on systolic and diastolic um, blood pressure, and that um, it's been associated with higher um, or associated with perceived stress in black women. So race, class, gender, um, they're all each important influences on health. Um, but one can argue that race and skin tone may be the most salient factors um, in African-American women's lives. Um, in trying to understand how race and skin tone may lead to poor perinatal health outcomes. Um, we can use a biopsychosocial model in which um, race-related stressors, such as racism, lead to heightened states of psychological and physiological um, path, uh, uh, stress responses. And these stress responses lead to poor physical outcomes. Um, these heightened um, states uh, can also um, in leading to adverse birth outcomes, they can, um, the pathway through which they may do this is through disruption of um, your immune or endocrine, neuroendocrine systems, um, as well as adoption of negative um, health behaviors um, or coping behaviors that may be beneficial to you in the acute moment, but in the long term, they're maladaptive. Um, as well as other psychological pathways such as uh, depressive symptoms and anxiety. Um, skin, uh, so so okay, so I said this a little bit earlier, but skin tone may um, interact with race to increase this vulnerability to race related stress for women of color. Um, including African-Americans, and this stress specifically stemming from skin tone or color-based discrimination that's different from race-based discrimination may also be conceptualized through this biopsychosocial model. So in essence, one may, by being a black woman, I may be exposed to racism or race-based uh, uh, race based stressors, right? My skin tone may increase that exposure level, right? But then on the side, my skin tone could also expose me to other stressors that are not necessarily race-based. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important um, that I have on the picture um, showing the intersection of race, skin tone, and gender is the line that shows the, the life course. And so this, you really have to take into consideration a person's lifespan um, and probably an intergenerational, um, intergenerationally too. Um, and um, in doing so, you have to consider the historical context in which a person lived or spent most of their life in, right? Um, because though that's gonna be times of exposure and vulnerability, right? As well as the social political context during that time point. And those are fluid things, they change, right? Um, so to ignore them is not really looking at um, racial disparities in a multi-dimensional way. Okay, 
So I did all that sort of conceptual um, foundation there, and I'm going to present two examples from the life course um, influences on fetal environment study. Um, this study was conducted in metropolitan Detroit. Um, it is a birth cohort um, of singleton live births that occurred between 2009 and 2011. It consists of all women who self-identified as black or African American. Um, they were between the ages of 18 and 45 years um, when, at the time of enrollment, um, and they were proficient in English. Um, in total, this, um, the cohort includes just a little over 1,400 um, black or African American women um, that were interviewed and then their medical records um, were abstracted. So the first study, um, we're going to ask the question, does social, political context, and skin tone influence African-American women's birth outcomes? Um, and I just want to quickly acknowledge my co-authors um, on the manuscripts that we're working on um, for their assistance in helping me integrate all these the sociologic and the epidemiologic <laughs> concepts all together. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about the sociopolitical context first and health. Um, so as I kind of pointed to earlier, the embodiment of effects um, of racism and colorism by blacks may be shaped by period and cohort effects that result from changes in historical or sociopolitical context. And so two of these are the 1960s US civil rights movement that ended, abolished Jim Crow laws. Um, and then we also have um, more softer movements like the Black, um, Black is Beautiful movement. Or today we have Black Lives Matters movement. Um, movements which are about increasing positive Black identity, right? Um, and research has examined the effects of large scale um, exogenous exogenous shocks or political events um, can that um, have on certain populations or groups. Um, I'm going to show you just two brief examples, but the first is a study by um, James Jackson um, and one of my co-authors, Tony Brown, um, in which they looked at racism and physical and mental health status. Um, of African Americans over a 13 year time span. And this study um, overlapped with the 1988 US presidential campaign of Jesse Jackson. Um, and, um, they, and then I'll just kind of point out that Jesse Jackson, he was, while well, he was not the first um, African American to run for president, he was um, the most successful until we had Barack Obama. Um, and so what they noted um, in this panel study was that there were improvements in black adults' views of racial progress um, around 1988 um, election. And they also noticed that there was reduced levels of psychological distress and health disability around that same time, time span. And so they, in trying to think about what are the things going on, since this is a national study, um, that were occurring that could, you know, um, in make blacks' views of racial progress improve, be more optimistic, right? Um, they um, um, hypothesized that it was the Jesse Jackson's um, political and social platform of human rights and racial progress. The second is a study by Lauderdale um, in which she looked at um, birth outcomes for Arabic named women um, in California pre and post 9-11. Um, and what she found was that Arabic women, uh, Arabic named women in California experienced a, a significant increase in adverse birth outcomes during the six months post 9-11 um, compared to that same time span um, 
a year prior to, to 9-11. And um, the hypothesis there is that, um, or the rationale there is that after 9-11, um, uh, Arab Americans um, experienced increased um, racial discrimination. Okay, so in this present study, we're going to draw our attention to um, the period that coincides with Jesse Jackson's two presidential campaigns. Um, and like I said earlier, Jesse Jackson was not the first person, first African American to run for U.S. president. Um, Shirley Chisholm had run before um, before him, but he was the most successful, um, and he actually won. Um, the state of Iowa in the Democratic Party. Um, and in, in 1984, he captured 20% of the Democratic primary, and in 1988, he captured 30%. So this was a very significant um, period. And he focused on, really focused on social justice and poverty and racism and um, human rights. Um, so what we did, was we considered, um, we sort of had two hypotheses here. We, um, we wanted to consider whether or not social political context shaped by the presidential campaign had a salubrious influence on birth outcomes of African American women. And the birth outcomes that we looked at were preterm delivery and low birth weight. Um, and we, divided our um, sample of women, we divided the life, women in the life study into two age cohorts. Those women born before the 1984 presidential election and those women born during 1984 after, right? And I think this is important because those women born before 1984, um, their, their, their ages or their birth years span between 1964 to 1983. So these women were growing up at, you know, at the beginning of integration, right? And um, the changing demographics of, um, in a Detroit that was still predominantly white. Whereas um, the women born post 1984, um, they're the ones that are growing up in this sort of new era in which you have somebody like Jesse Jackson speaking about um, positive black identity, right? Um, and so just to further um, examine heterogeneity in African-American women's experiences, we also look to see whether skin color interacts with the birth or the maternal age cohort. Um, in um, to influence um, preterm delivery and low birth weight, and um, based off of the um, the background that I presented earlier, we would hypothesize that we would see the lighter skin or lighter complexioned women would have the the lowest rates of preterm birth or um, low birth weight, and darker um, uh, African American women would have the highest. So this slide is, um, presents the, uh, it's the prevalence of preterm uh, delivery. Um, the first is uh, for the full life cohort, a life study um, of 16% of the women had a preterm um, delivery, preterm birth. And then the other two bars represent our two maternal age cohorts. So. As you can see, there's not much difference um, between our, our two cohorts with respect to the rate of um, preterm birth. Now this slide is looking at the interact, is um, stratifying by both maternal age cohort as well as skin tone. And um, this proved to be a very interesting <laughs> slide for um, me and my colleagues to try to wrap our heads around, especially when we get to our younger cohort. So what we see is that while 
the um, rate for um, the rate of preterm birth for um, both our younger and our older cohort don't differ. When we stratify also by skin tone, that's where we see the heterogeneity. And in our older cohort, um, so pre-1984, women born between 1964 to 1983, we see that it does correlate to our hypothesis, right, in that um, uh, women who with a light brown complexion have the lowest rate of preterm birth and women in um, uh, our dark brown um, uh, group have the highest rate of preterm birth. But when we get over to this 1984, post-1984 um, age cohort, we actually see a bit of a paradox. It's the complete opposite. And I think the other thing to pay attention to is sort of where um, where each of these groups fall with respect to the red dotted line, which is um, the U.S. Uh, rate of preterm birth for non-Hispanic whites. So you see that in the pre-1984 group, our light um, brown complexioned black women have a rate that is basically equivalent to non-Hispanic whites, right? Okay. So what we wanted to do after we did our descriptive analysis is we wanted to follow this up with a, um, a regression analysis um, and try to control for, um, you know, other variables that may influence the association, um, the relationship between um, our maternal cohort, our skin tone, and, and preterm delivery. Um, so the first, um, the first one is represents, or this slide just represents the main effects. It doesn't present the interaction, and it really just maps right onto um, that first descriptive slide that I showed you, in which there's it's not showing an association between um, the maternal age cohort and preterm delivery or um, n no association between skin tone and um, preterm delivery. And here is our um, analysis um, that does, um, it's a stratified one, but it uh, to, it's a stratified analysis. Um, in which we stratified on the maternal age cohort so that you could see the prevalence ratios um, for uh, preterm birth for each skin tone group. Um, and it's important to note that the maternal age and skin tone interaction was, was significant and that significance did not change, budge at all as we added in um, demographic variables, um, and what you see here in our pre-1984, um, our older cohort, our pre-1984 cohort, is that um, medium and um, dark to very dark um, African-American women compared to um, lighter complexioned African-American women have um, almost a twofold or close to a twofold um, difference in, in preterm delivery. Um, and then when we move over to the um, post-1984 cohort, our younger cohort, um, we see that paradox in which the, um, our very light to light skin tone African American women have a higher probability of preterm delivery but are medium and very dark um, skin tone. It's lower. So um, it could be that, you know, the platform of Jesse Jackson during that time um, helped to create the paradox that we saw, right? So these, so women in the younger cohort growing up in around messages of um, positive racial identity um, and um, increased positive views about um, 
racial progress um, may um, have benefited, right? Um, medium and darker complexion black women may have benefited from this message. Um, but it could also be, um, or this paradox could also be due to the fact that Detroit had significant changes in its demographic composition. So between, um, so in 1960, the city was predominantly white. Um, and by 1980, it's a majority black city. And by 2000, it's an 80, 85% um, black and whites make up only 10 per point. Um, five percent. So it could be that you know more affluent, light-skinned African American women who were born in Detroit um, in the mid to eight, eight, late eighties um, and early nineties were more likely to leave. Um, and so those light-skinned African American women still living in Detroit who were in our in our study, right, were had higher risk due to their maybe lower um, social status. Um, my perspective is it's probably both that created the paradox in that you have the changing demographics and within a city that is now predominantly black, it creates the perfect opportunity for positive um, uh, a social platform about racial progress and um, positive black identity to take hold. Okay, so the second study is a little bit more straightforward and less complicated, I think. <laughs> um, in this one, we looked at racial, the relationship between racial microaggressions and receipt of prenatal care um, in the same study sample. And then we asked whether or not skin tone influences this relationship. And I really wanna acknowledge um, my um, a Drexel alum, she was um, from the School of Public Health. She was a master's student who worked with me on this project. Okay, so, you know, the literature suggests um, that racial discrimination is a major barrier for um, the utilization of healthcare. And a recent 2017 report um, on the Amer African Americans' experiences of discrimination that was put out. Um, by NPR, Harvard, as well as um, Robert Wood Johnson, um, in which they sur surveyed African Americans um, about experiences of discrimination. They find that you know, fifty percent, um, you know, report discrimination in interacting with the police when um, applying to jobs. Uh, being paid equally or considered for a promotion. Um, they perceive um, experiencing racial slurs, um, as well as people making negative assumptions or offensive comments about their race. Um, and I think this last one is really, really important when we're talking about healthcare, is that um, a, Substantial proportion also say that they make efforts to avoid um, certain interactions, um, social interactions, because they don't want to encounter discrimination. So, um, you know, 33% avoid calling the police, even if you need them, right? Um, or crimes being committed against you, right? Um, and 22% said that they avoid medical care, um, even if they need it. So I think that that's that's really important. Um, so it may not necessarily be discrimination actually in the healthcare setting, but it's lived experiences may influence what you do, right? So um, again, we're just looking at First, whether or not there's a relationship between racial microaggressions and prenatal care utilization. And then we're gonna look to see if skin tone um, moderates this relationship. Um, and just to kind of, uh, for those who aren't as familiar with racial microaggressions, um, they are often 
um, encountered experiences more often than major experiences of racism, um, such as the encounters with police um, or being fired because you're black or you know because of your race or being denied a loan. Those are more major experiences. Microaggressions, they happen with greater frequency and they create this atmosphere of expectation um, that something's gonna happen. So in essence, you're talking about vigilance. They create hypervigilance, right? Um, so these are just some examples of microaggressions. Um, you know, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl. Um, why do you sound white? Um, I never see you as a black girl. Um, so what, uh, so what does your hair look like today? Um, uh, the limited representation of my race in your classroom does not make me um, the voice of all black people. So being that, that representative um, and, you know, for example, for people who may be multiracial, people asking you, what are you? Well, you know, um, if we want to bring this even closer into women, um, how does being a black woman who is children, who has children or is pregnant perceived, right? Um, how many children do you have? Um, are you on welfare? You know, I mean, these are day-to-day -day questions that can add up. So to, me to measure microaggressions, um, we used um, the daily life experiences of racism and bother scale. And um, we asked women to think about um, the past year. So um, their pregnancy plus the three months prior to pregnancy. Um, and it's 20 items asking people about um, touching topics such as being um, treated as stupid, followed in public places, jokes. Um, and so it asks about the frequency in which you've encountered this, but also how much did it bother you? Um, so in this analysis, we had um, just a little over 1,200 of the 1,400 women in life um, with complete data um, for this question. Um, Almost 18% received no prenatal care. Um, the mean um, DLEB score, uh, racial microaggression score, was a 96, which some would say, would think is kind of low, considering the scale can range from 20 to um, theoretically 720. Um, However, that's pretty standard um, of uh, sort of that low score is pretty standard across the board in um, report, perceived reports. Um, and in this study, we, we looked at greater or less, um, did you experience greater or less experiences of microaggression? So women who had a score greater than 71, which was the median, are viewed as more microaggressions, and those under 71 are less microaggressions. So um, this graph here, what it shows is the US um, uh, rate of no prenatal care, later no prenatal care for non-Hispanic blacks. Um, the, Gray bar is for the full life sample. And then you see um, the percent of no prenatal care by, um, by skin tone. Um, and we see that light brown um, is not actually the lowest, like one would hypothesize. Um, it's actually medium brown. And here is our multivariate regression um, in which the first um, bar represents that, that just looking at the relationship between microaggressions and um, 
no prenatal care. And we see that, um, oops, I didn't change these numbers, I'm sorry. But you do see that there is an effect um, on um, the um, greater microaggressions is associated with um, not receiving prenatal care. Um, and then when we stratify, uh, when we stratify um, this relationship and um, by skin tone, we see that um, for light skin tone and for dark skin tone, there is um, a greater probability of not receiving prenatal care compared to medium complexioned. And so why, why? Well, like I said earlier, right, um, racial microaggressions may, you know, create this feeling like something racist is going to happen. So people who have experienced more of them may have greater hypervigilance and avoidance of um, social interactions in which they feel that they may be discriminated against. Um, and then why do we see this relationship with skin tone? Um, so in the social science literature, um, when we talk about, when they talk about um, skin tone bias or colorism within the African American community, it, it operates quite differently than colorism or skin tone bias. That's between groups, right? So um, while within the black community, light may have more advantage, right? Um, because of that advantage, you may also face more bullying or derogatory names, um, may affect self-esteem, right? And there's actually literature, there's a couple of qualitative studies with women that have delved into this and they find that um, women with medium brown um, skin tone, they actually have the most neutral um, names uh, attached to them. Whereas um, women on the ends of the spectrum, they actually have more derogatory names um, at them. And so, I think that really speaks to the trend that we saw, that kind of U-shaped trend, in that if medium complexioned black women are receiving fewer microaggressions, right, then maybe there is this less of a buildup with respect to anticipation of racial events happening. So there, really needs to be more work to look into this um, and to some of the mechanisms. Um, but this is just a picture, I think, that really um, kind of defines the, the, the line that you're walking, right? Um, you know, some of the things that are on here is, why don't you do something with your hair if you wear it natural? Um, you know, if you straighten your hair, why don't you wear your hair natural? Um, you know, um, so in essence, I started this, this journey, um, in part to just better understand the heterogeneity within the black community, um, and within black women so that we can better understand what's driving, um, the risk for preterm birth and maternal mortality, you know, the negative outcomes um, so that we can improve health and that we can actually develop interventions. Um, the majority of biomedical literature focuses on between groups. And while that helps you to know that a health disparity exists, it doesn't always allow you to understand why it exists. And you may miss um, important concepts that may not be relevant to one group, but are very salient to another group. Um, and then, 
just in, in maternal and child health, and I know in a lot of other areas, um, you know, there's been this real push for a life to bring in a life course perspective over the last um, several decades. Um, and I'm just going to use this um, picture from um, Michael Liu's um, publication, which really shows the two trajectories um, of um, reproductive potential for whites versus other others who have a minority status for their across their life course. And the green arrows represent the protective factors, the red arrows represent the risk factors. Um, and so it's really trying to A, understand what are all the risk factors occurring across the life course, um, trying to bring about greater protective factors that can push the reproductive potential up not just of one group, but of both groups. And if that means um, distributing resources that are not, not equally so that we can achieve equity, then that's what we got to do. Um, but what I want to say is that just thinking about things from a life course perspective is not enough. While it gets us closer, we have to in thinking about a life course perspective, we have to think about the historical context that overlaps with one's life course, as well as the socio-political context. And how does the um, constructs representing social identity intersect to lead to the health outcomes? 